Here's a few news articles. This one I thought was very interesting. Um, an interferometer is an optical device where you take a beam of light and you get either have two sources or more commonly you break a light into two pieces with a half silvered mirror and then you recombine that light and the light interferes and the interference pattern lets you see the details of the light. So you can make a telescope that works on this principle where you have two um, telescopes and then you capture the light and move it through an optical fiber and then combine them at a central point. And then you can get details about an astronomical object, uh, but the resolution depends on how far apart you can make those things. And in fact, you cannot move the light to great a distance through optical fiber before it degrades and it doesn't work anymore. So this new technique, there are a few techniques, some of them involving quantum entanglement, but the one that seems most promising involves something I've never heard of called a quantum hard drive, where you can take a series of supercooled atoms and you can impress upon those atoms the quantum state of the light and it will then persist for a long period of time. Theoretically, it can, you can get it to persist for up to three months, although the prototype they made, it only persists for about six hours. But then you could have a quantum telescope thousands of miles away from another one, and you could record the photons it captured in their full quantum state, and then record them at the other one, and then take the two drives into a lab and play them back and have them interfere with each other, which is fantastic. And this would have a lot of consequences if we could this would be the storage devices we need for quantum computing, something that stores the full quantum uncertain state of real quantum qubits. So those things uh, exist in a limited, difficult prototype form, but they're coming. Anyway, so that's an interesting step forward. They don't have this working yet, but they have some of the pieces required working. This one is fantastic. Um, Moxie Marlinspike is a huge security celebrity. He's one of the world's greatest living cryptographers, however, and he started a instant message app called Signal, which is, of course, very encrypted, and he is very adamant that his app should be more perfectly encrypted and more secure than anybody else's. And yeah, that's right. And the point here is... <clears throat> This Celebrite is a company, I remember I met the CEO of Celebrite in Sri Lanka, they make a device that you can only buy if you are a selected customer, primarily law enforcement agencies all over the world, and government agencies, and this device will gather data from cell phones. And um, nobody, it's not open source, nobody really knows quite how it works, nobody really can get their hands on one to analyze it very easily, but um, they're picky about who they sell it to, they say, but they're widely criticized by uh, civil rights organizations as selling it to oppressive regimes who use it to spy on people. But about a few months ago, Celebrite claimed that they had hacked into Signal and they could penetrate Signal encrypted messages. And this made Moxie Marlin Spike very upset. He said, I did not penetrate my encryption. What they did was if you save the messages on your phone, they hacked into the phone and stole and st stole the saved data, which is not in any way compromising the security of Signal. And so, having irritated Moxie, Moxie got a Celebrite machine and reverse engineered it, and it was amazing. He totally found that the, the machine, the Celebrite machine is running a Windows XP version that's like 10 years out of date. It's using thousands of unsecured libraries, and he not only figured out how to hack into it, he figured out how to add files to your data so that when they are analyzed on a Celebrite machine, they will have arbitrary code execution consequences. So this means he's had, he has, in principle, destroyed the entire value of Celebrite because he said he has found files and he has demonstrations. So you could make a file which, when you plug a phone in and analyze it on a Celebrite, it changes the results, like the dates and the files. So the evidence that you take to court to say this data came off the phone is not true. And he said, from now on, in unrelated news, Signal is going to have random extra files in the app that I find uh, aesthetically appealing, that will change frequently, and you'll never know whether you have them or not. But from now on, every phone with signal on it will have these random extra files, and I don't really know why I bother putting this note at the end of this report. 
So he's going to put poison pills in Signal just to break any Celebrite device that ever analyzes a phone with Signal on it. And if that actually happens a few times, it would seem to destroy the ability to use Signal in court. So anyway, it's amazing stuff. And uh, yeah, that's right. He said a uh, Celebrite machine fell off a truck. You know, another person said he just bought some on eBay. But somehow he got his hands on one, which you're not supposed to get on. And what he found is what you almost always find with closed source products. If they won't let you examine it and tell you what's in it, what's in there is usually complete crap. Like if someone says it's encrypted, but they won't tell you what the encryption routine is, that's a really, really bad sign. And uh, someone's asking whether Celebrate was used to hack into the iPhone in the shooting. Um, if you're talking about the terrorist event in Southern California, it was not. It would turn out to be another company. It was widely believed to be Celebrate at the time, but it was another company that was used to hack into that phone. There are a few companies that make these phone hacking tools. Celebrate is the most famous, and uh, but apparently... This tends to happen in any kind of closed system where your stuff is like a military or police secret. Since nobody ever examines it, you just don't bother to keep it updated and all that jazz. So anyway, um, of course, in the long run, obviously Celebrite needs to up their game. They need to update the system. They need to remove the use of vulnerable packages. You know, um, this is why, you know, I get, I get angry letters from people after I use their their miserable app in my DEF CON talks and classes. Usually after about five years of humiliation, they respond and say, why are you picking on us? Quit talking about us. And I'm like, well, you know, your first response is to shoot the messenger. But if you get over that, you might realize that you actually should stop making a piece of shit that nobody should be using. You should actually make a more secure product. And then you won't have a bunch of irritating people like me nipping at your heels saying, your stuff is crap. Your stuff is crap. <laughs> so anyway, in the long run, Moxie is doing them a favor by exposing how... Um, how insecure their product is, but the people don't usually uh, uh, see that right away. Oh, yes, I've received physical threats and death threats, although not for disclosing vulnerabilities. Um, I got death threats for teaching um, CISSP classes, and I got death threats for resisting the, the jester. When the jester decided to recruit 10-year-olds to join his army and then attack uh, like the drug cartels. And I said, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> no, he was uh, CISSP classes. Oh, there was a, in 2012, there was a huge, um, there they didn't threaten to kill me. They just hacked the college or th pretended to hack the college to try to get me fired uh, because um, there was an angry security blogger that um, lost his CISSP for unethical conduct and therefore decided the CISSP is evil. You know, there's been a lot of silly drama in this business. It's pretty calm these days. Now, 2011, 2012, there was a lot of comic book drama in the security field. It was kind of like the political field now, where if you say anything political, like people say, if you criticize Elon Musk or cryptocurrency, or if you somehow irritate the Trump supporters, then you'll get death threats. It happens to anybody that that's the importance politically. Anyway, so um, these, in a similar spirit, these guys decided to try to um, see if they could sneak bad code into the Linux kernel as like a social psychological experiment. And what's surprising is they got permission from the college to do this. The um, Ethical Standards Committee said, well, that's not, um, that does not an experiment on human subjects. And I'm like, you don't think the Linux developers are human subjects? <laughs> I would think they were human subjects if you'd asked me. And so, of course, they did manage to sneak some kind of bad stuff in. And then everybody got really mad and said, you rotten bums and blocked them and, you know, said you never should have done this. And, you know, I... I'm surprised. Don't suits from big corps. Yeah, yeah. Suits from big corps do things like send me letters saying, stop criticizing our product. You're violating terms of service or something. Yeah, I get a little bit of that. Not much because nothing I do is that important. I'm not a big famous phone researcher that finds the really red letter stuff that hits the NSA bulletins and stuff. I'm just an ordinary college professor. I just do things that you find in textbooks. I don't really discover much of anything new or super exciting. <laughs> anyway. I think we're up to the official time here. So let me uh, get down to the... All right, so here we are with 129S. And it's cross-site scripting today. So I'm going to talk about that. And I'm glad to say Kahoot is working again, so we can do some Kahoots. Kahoot quit working yesterday and uh, bothered me, but it started working again today. So I guess it was nothing on my machine. It was just something 
wrong on Kahoot or perhaps on Google. I saw some clues that it might have been Google OAuth not working too well. But anyway, whatever it was, it got better. So let's start with slides about it, and then we'll do some Kahoots. So let me get rid of that. All right, so we're talking about cross-site scripting, which is by far the most common vulnerability on the web. And a great number of companies just don't care and don't patch it. And they won't usually give you any money for finding it. And yet you can do some nasty things with it. So um, if so, it, you can make the browser run code. It's a code injection vulnerability. I can make your browser run code, typically in JavaScript. But I can't run code on the company's server. So companies typically don't really care. But I am running code on their clients' browsers, which is not a good idea, because in your browser, I could do things like stealing cookies, and I might be able to find other kinds of data. And if there's a browser vulnerability that lets me run code in the operating system underneath it, which there are often, then I can escalate it to take over your machine and install malware and all that jazz. So there's three basic types, although I'm, I went through it again today, and I think this might be an unfair statement, reflected, stored, and DOM-based, although I would think there's reflected and stored, and then the DOM-based would also come in a reflected and stored uh, type, but it doesn't really matter. Anyway, we'll talk about them. The most common, of course, is reflected cross-site scripting. Um, this is where you type in something on a web page, like in a search engine, and the reply includes your query. So for example, if I go to Google and I put in frog, it used to say results for frog right there. It doesn't there. It says them over. It doesn't seem to even repeat it at all. Let's see if any of the others are still repeating it. It used to be they would all repeat it. Let's try Yahoo. Does Yahoo still have a search engine? It does. So if I search for frog, It imitates Google. In fact, it's probably even run by Google. Well, I may be out of good ideas. Let's see, is ask.com still around? This used to be buried. If I search for frog, usually it would say results for frog. And maybe they've all wised up not to do it. They've all wised up not to do it. Anyway, if you put the word frog on the page at the top, here's the results for frog, then I could try injecting a script tag in this. And when it echoes it back, it might echo the script tag back too and it might even run in the browser, and that's reflected cross-site scripting. So let me go to mine. I've got a page, of course, I wrote just to demonstrate it, which does it the old-fashioned way. So here is a page, and of course you've got a bunch of these in the, uh, the labs that we're, we're going through. All right, so here, this one here has, a, you can put something here like, hello, and when you hit submit, it says, er hello. So this is an error message that is somehow includes text that came from you. Now, DuckDuckGo, oh good, DuckDuckGo has that result. Neat, oh. Well, let me, uh, that's interesting. Let's take a look at DuckDuckGo. Here's DuckDuckGo. If I search for frog, See, it doesn't say results for frog anymore. It just has the frog still up there. So if I tried to put in a script tag, it would be a script alert one slash script, for example. That would pop up a box containing one. So I search for that. It's just going to search for it, and then it's going to leave it up here. So it didn't run the script. It just displayed the tag. You could also perhaps put it in the URL. It's up in the URL too, but it doesn't ever run the script. This is a safe website that does not have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, you can put in script tags, but it does not ever run them in your browser. It remembers what they are. Typically what it does is URL encode them, like ampersand, LT, semicolon. So it's not interpreted by the browser as a script tag. This is, the, this is a good website that is not vulnerable to cross-site scripting. But this one here that I wrote, of course, is. So if I take this and I put in that same stuff, frog and then a script, oops, I got to spell alert better, don't I? All right, and submit. Now it runs, it puts in the frog 
and then it runs a script and pops up the box. So this is what you typically do to find the vulnerability as a proof of concept is pop up a box. And the fact that I can pop up a box means I was able to run JavaScript and I could in principle run nastier JavaScript that does anything JavaScript can do, like steal a cookie. Or I could do this. I could inject um, HTML then. So I could do this. And now I've injected a URL to evil.com. And so now it says, please go to our new page, and that will take you to evil.com. So I've managed to add text to the page, which the developer did not intend to be there, and even a link to the page. And I can even make scripts that will do it. So you, it's just up to your imagination. You have some control over the browser. You can steal cookies and so on. All right. So that's, that's reflected cross-site scripting. And here's how it works. You, you can send, the attacker sends you a URL. Now see, the way I did it here was the way you do it just to see the proof of concept. Let me put in my um, frog thing again. I don't have to put it in here. Frog uh, script. All right, there's a script alert reflected XSS vulnerability. That'll do. Submit. Okay, so here I just tested it to find it. But if you look up here, here's the URL. This URL has the domain name and then a question mark and then a message and has script tags up here in the URL. So what I could do is I could send this to somebody else in an instant message or an email. And when they click it, the script will run on their machine. So I'm able to send them code. And when they, it's something, oh, so I thank you. It's off the screen. Good. All right. Thanks for telling me. Um, so when you, uh, that's what's up here in the URL. So I could send you this URL, and I might put it through like a URL shortener or something. And then when you click on it, you will run the code. So you think you were just getting a web page to go to, but you're actually getting is something that will run code when you click on it. So I, that's what's the common way you implement this attack. And that's what this picture shows. The attacker prepares a malicious URL and somehow tricks you into clicking on it by sending you a message or an email or something. And when you click on it, you send a request to the server and the request contains data, which is not script in your browser yet. But when the response comes, your, the data that comes back, your browser runs it. So I, the attacker is now able to run code on your machine by bouncing it off a vulnerable server. So the company will sit up here and say, you didn't hack my company. You did not run code on my server. You did not steal any data from my server, didn't take anything down. But your customers are getting harmed because of your vulnerable server. But you can argue it's not your fault. You know, you run, you're being used to bounce an attack off of. So anyway, that's the most common situation of reflected cross-site scripting. All right, and so if you've logged in and you have a cookie storing the fact that you've logged in, then I could just include a JavaScript that takes that cookie and sends it back to me, and then I can get in your account. One of the many things you can do with it. So you'll make a uh, script like this that goes to my URL and, ins and inserts your cookie somewhere, like in the, in the um, URL. And then if I look at my server logs, I will be able to get that information. All right. So that's, uh, all right. Now, this, this way, I can defeat the same origin policy. See, you were at some website like eBay, and I want your eBay cookie. If eBay has a cross-site scripting vulnerability, then I'm able to send a URL that will go to eBay and then have some kind of script hidden in it. You'll make a request to eBay, and if they don't, if they allow me to bounce injected script off their server, then I can execute code in your browser, and the code in your browser will take the data from eBay and send it to another URL with that cookie. This defeats the same origin policy. The point of a browser is, is that if I'm at a certain website, it will only send the cookies to domains on that website. But I can use JavaScript to tell it to send a copy of that cookie somewhere else if you didn't make that cookie um, HTTP only, which would prevent this. So that's the game here. So I have managed to take script and add it to a page which the developer did not put there. And that's cross-site scripting. All right, and then there's stored cross-site scripting, which is just a small modification of the same thing. And here, I store data on the server, like in a tweet or on a Facebook wall or somewhere where I'm able to put data and I'm able to put scripts in there. So I store something. And now when this person just looks at it, 
the response is going to contain scripts which executes. So uh, this is pretty common and easy enough to do. And I've got one of them too. I suppose it's worth taking a look at, although I think it's kind of obvious. Um, so here's the stored XS demo. So I can uh, go in and give it a name. And then here I am. Um, I'm going to erase comments. And now if I post a comment, I can say hi. Post a comment. And it just has hi on my board. This is like a cheap little Facebook clone, but this one's, of course, vulnerable. So I could put in this standard script to see a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And now this one has a script in it. So if I erase the comments to get rid of that, I can now try um, this one here. This one here will redirect my page. So here I am at samsclass.info. When I put in this comment, it's going to use JavaScript to change the document location to City College. So I post that comment. It goes over here. Um, and so this, has, this was used on uh, Barack Obama's message board when he was running in a primary against Hillary Clinton. And uh, I can also inject a frame like an ad that will contain code from another location. So I could inject a link to a malicious server. So now I've got, now Firefox is smart enough not to let this happen anymore. The browsers are getting smarter about this. But this is trying to show you content from another URL in the page. And the browsers are putting in more and more mitigations against these things. Anyway, so I bet this one's probably not going to work. You know, this one might work. This will alert and pop up the cookie. All right, let's see. Get rid of that. All right. Yep, and so it pops up a cookie, and you see various cookies here. And the one I put on that page was just put your name in a cookie. Name is Sam. The rest of this is some kind of automatically generated stuff. But the point is the cookie pops up, and I could have just sent it to some other server with JavaScript also. So that's how you can steal somebody's server if there is a cross-site scripting vulnerability on their page. You can steal their cookie, and then you can get in their account if they don't have anti-cross-site scripting measures like some other thing besides the cookie. For example, the cookie could include your IP address or some other number tied to your machine so that I can't use the cookie from a different machine. It won't accept it. All right, and so that's stored cross-site scripting, where I store data, and anybody that views that page, it runs their script. And then this one often confuses students. It used to confuse me. It's really pretty simple. This uses the document object model. The only point of this one is the data that comes down from the server is not immediately executed on your browser. It's stored somewhere on the page and then used to calculate another part of the page where it executes. So all it is is this. It could be either stored or reflected, but you get a response which has a script in it, and that's stored in your browser but not run but the contents of one part of your page are used to calculate another part of the page, and that's where it runs. So it sort of uh, bounces off your browser back to the same browser. So that's the game. Um, and it happens if you have some kind of calculated part of a page that's based on other data on the page. So for example, a dynamically generated error message. And so I've got an example of that here. Let me bring it up, DOM-based XSS. Yeah, all right. So here you see a message is high. And up here, you see a parameter, the message is high. So, so far, it looks exactly like the reflected or stored one that we saw before. This is appearing on the page. But in fact, it isn't just put directly on the page. It's the script here is calculating the content of that message. It goes into the URL and finds the message and then um, takes that substring and then writes it to this object called message. That's all. So it, it's just that JavaScript is used in an unusual way to put the message there instead of directly. But it has the same effect that if I put a script tag up here, alert one script, then it executes the script. So. It's just technically, it didn't go straight from here to there. It went from here down to this script, which put it there.
That's why they say it involves the document object model. It involves this uh, JavaScript that can pick some data off your page and then print it out on the page somewhere. All right. Anyway, let's try some cahoots about that. Now that my cahoots are working again. Well, the contest becomes uh, sh sort of pointless if there's only three. <laughs> ah, good. That's better. Four is better. Four is enough to make it not. Ah, five is even better. Okay, good, good. <laughs> I'll give it a few more seconds. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. I don't know what happened to the music. Maybe that's why it was down. They were changing the music and breaking it. Anyway, let's give it a shot. All right. What's the most common web app vulnerability? Site scripting, of course. All right. All right. So script in the query string runs on the results page. What's that? reflected cross-site scripting where you put some data up and it bounces back to you all right what attack can steal session cookies any of them any kind of cross-site scripting if I can run a script in your browser I can steal session cookies. Doesn't matter how I get it in there. All right, and what attack will commonly steal all the data in a database? Yep, none of these can do that. That's why people don't care. That's SQL injection. But cross-site scripting does not let me steal any data directly off the company server, which is why companies typically say it's not really their problem and don't give it a high priority to fix it. All right. Right, so one of those is a name I know who they are. The others aren't going to get their points unless they come out of the closet. But anyway, all right, so let's go back to the slides. All right, so now we can talk about a few examples in the real world. Of course, they're all over the place. Uh, Apache had one in 2010 that was pretty notable. 
it was in the issue tracker where the developers could report problems and discuss how to fix them. And so an attacker was able to inject code and get an administrator to click the link by putting it, I think, in a problem report. So there was code hidden in that, and now they stole the administrator's cookie. So then they were able to alter the upload folder and put a Trojan login form there and steal everybody's uh, credentials as they logged in. So they were able to get Apache privileged users and they were able to totally get inside the system and mess with the Apache source code and all that jazz. Um, in a way, this is what happened recently to SolarWinds, although they didn't use that exact technique. But if you're able to get into the development servers of a popular product, you can poison the product and infect a lot of people. MySpace, this was, uh, of course, the predecessor to Facebook, that early version of the same thing. So Sammy Kamkar, a famous hacker, put script in a post on his page so that all of his friends, it would then say, hey, Sammy, you just put up a new post. It would infect all his friends. And he made it an automated attack. So when your browser displayed his comment, it would automatically send a copy of it to everybody in your address book. And they would all see it too. So it would just spread throughout the whole network. And so within hours, he had 1 million friends on MySpace. It would make you everybody would become his friend and then send this script to everybody they knew and they would also become his friend until he had all all of them. Of course, one thing about this is an incredibly obvious who did it. He wasn't hiding. It was a demonstration of cross-cut scripting vulnerabilities. I think Sammy eventually did get some legal trouble for all these stunts, but it was a famous demonstration that I think woke up everybody to how dangerous cross-site scripting could be. This one was fun. A company called Strong Web Mail was one of the first two-factor authentication emails. And he said, nobody can hack us because we have two-factor authentication. And they totally hacked him through cross-site scripting because they installed the thing and played with it and found out that even though it did use two-factor, it would make a phone call to send you a number and you needed that number to log in. You could then say, trust this machine, and it wouldn't keep calling you. So typically, everybody's primary laptop would not be using two-factor. It would instead be using a stored cookie, just like every other service. So they then found a cross-site scripting vulnerability on the service, and then they emailed him a PDF file saying, we want the 10 grand, we have hacked you. And they had not yet hacked him. But when he opened the PDF, that opened a URL, which triggered the cross-site scripting, which stole his cookie. So and then they'd hacked him. So, and uh, he owed him 10,000 bucks. I don't know if he actually paid up. I know there was a, um, I think in Texas, the guy said that he would give a million bucks to anybody that found proof of voter fraud, and then they proved that some Republicans cheated, and I think he didn't pay up. But anyway, um, happened to Twitter, quite frequently on Twitter. Twitter had worms spreading through Twitter. Um, yeah, anyway, it's easy enough to do there. Things would pop up. And uh, so you can do a lot of things, like I said. You can do a virtual defacement where one page shows content from another page or redirects to another page. So, you know, you are on a different server than you think you're at or add images or code or anything to a page. And so you saw this where you can put a link onto a page. All right. And you could actually inject actual working functionality. You could, if you can inject text and a HT. TP code that makes a link appear, you could put in other code like this. You could put in all this code, see all this um, hexadecimal stuff up here, makes a whole form saying Google will be a subscription service, it's going to cost $10, I need your credit card, submit. You could put in a whole form with a button which would now appear on the page. So, you know, that's, uh, you can put a whole Trojan code there which did not really come from this server, it's actually up there in the URL but the user probably won't uh, realize that. All right, so um, one thing about session hijacking attacks, where I steal a cookie, I get a cookie, now I'm going to have to go to that page and use something like BERT to change the cookie to get in that account. So that's not terribly automatic. I could perhaps automate it, but it would be a lot more fun to just decide what I want to do, like I want to make you buy my book at Amazon, and I find a way to steal Amazon cookies, so instead of stealing the cookies and then logging in your account and buying the book, it'd be more cooler to just make an attack that automatically buys my book. Since I can run script and I can run it in your browser within the context of your authenticated session to steal your cookie, instead of stealing your cookie, I could just use it. And that's what Sammy Kamkar did. You didn't have to do anything. 
as soon as your MySpace would post the comment that came from Samsi, your MySpace would immediately take the action he wanted to take. So that's what you do. And uh, if you want to perform an administrative action, you could just try it on every victim until you hit somebody with high enough privileges to do it. All right. So um, your, your browsers will trust JavaScript cookies from the same website. Um, all right. And you can also um, launch third-party code on the system if you're in trusted sites in Internet Explorer, at least in old versions. So then JavaScript could, in fact, run code on the host. I'm, I hope that's no longer true of Edge or anything these days. I haven't tried it in a long time. All right. And there used to be ActiveX. I don't think people are using it much anymore, but ActiveX also had that property that code on your website could run code on the Windows machine underneath it, which is one of the many uh, disturbing things about it. And I think that's why it's pretty much fallen into disfavor. All right. And so if you can you can log keystrokes that are in the browser. You can capture the browsing history. You can send requests from the browser to other machines on the network and start scanning for other machines. You can do quite a lot just by controlling the browser, but they keep putting more defenses in the browser. There's a tool you'll find in um, Kali called Beef, Browser Exploitation Framework. And I remember writing products projects about this where you try to use Beef to take over a browser, and it turned out that the browsers keep patching these vulns really fast, so most of the really fun things don't work. Well, yeah, and that's what you saw even my cross-site scripting demonstrations here. Some of them fail because browsers keep adding more defenses. That seems to be one place where it's uh, pretty effective to put in defenses, just patching the browser to not run suspicious code. So let's try 12b. Guess that's it. All right, which one earned ten thousand dollars? Yeah, that was strong web mail. All right. All right, which one did Sammy Kamakar do? It made him famous. That was MySpace Worm. All right, which one gained administrative access? Apache, yeah. All right, what's which one is labor intensive, requiring you to use cookies one by one? Yep, that's session hijacking. You hijack one session, but it. Uh, it's generally a manual process, doing one account at a time. All right, Erica. All right. All right. All right, I 
think we can go ahead. All right, and now we got stuff like you've seen in previous uh, classes, the little tricks you do to sneak it past defenses. So you got to deliver this malicious URL somehow. So you can just send an email containing the URL or an instant message or put it on some website where people will, will click on it or it'll execute. The watering hole attack is one China started long ago to attack people having to do with Tibetan independence. And now it's quite common. If you don't want to directly interact with the victim, like sending them an email, you put it on a website, which they will naturally go to. So you're targeting people in some political or ethnic group. So you put up a website with a lot of keywords so that when they go searching for the topic of interest to them, they will go there. That's a watering hole attack. And you can, another thing you do is purchase ad space and just put the malicious URL in the ad. Uh, there are an increasing number of defenses against this, but sometimes it works. Um, all right. You can sometimes uh, use these websites that will let you tell a friend or send feedback to create a message which goes to people and appears to come from inside the organization and therefore might escape some defenses. But, you know, the simplest way is in-band, where you put in fields that have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Uh, usernames, emails, telephone numbers, the search string I showed you. You know, anything that you put onto the server, which is then ultimately presented back to the user, could in principle be a um, source of cross-site scripting. And then there's out-of-band, things like uh, ejecting code that eventually ends up in emails, something other than the target app. And the same thing may be there. Now, so the cross-site scripting itself does not let you run any code on the server, but you might be able to use it as part of another attack. Remember the Apache server, you were able to steal a cookie out of a browser, and then you were able to use that to log in as administrator, and then you had the ability to change files on the server. So like that, it can work out. So for example, if I'm allowed to insert script into a user's displayed name, and then another flaw lets me put that in other people's names, then I can make it so I get everybody's uh, t uh, cookie because when their name appears on the screen, it will run a script. All right, so if you want to find these, um, you, the simple way is what I did. You just put in a script that will run and pop up an alert box of some kind. Uh, that's the simple test, but that won't catch them all because they might have some kind of uh, security feature that tries to block the direct injection of script tags. So you are ways to sneak through those defenses. So it might be removing script or removing less than and greater than signs or so on. So you can try to change the uppercase, lowercase to uppercase. You can URL encode the special characters. You can repeat the forbidden words more than once so that one pass of removing it uh, won't block it. You can put in null bytes, which hopefully will stop the web application firewall, which is written in C, but it will then not stop the server behind it. That's the sort of thing, just like the other attacks. All right, um, sometimes the data you send up doesn't come back unmodified. It has been cleaned up in some, to some extent, so you might have to overcome that. So you can put in just a benign string, like of random letters, and then look to see um, if those random letters appear anywhere in the response. And then that would be a possible place to try injecting cross-site scripting, just to see where you appear to control something which is sent back to the browser. And so you choose a unique string like this, my XSS test and some random letters, and then just see if that ever comes back to you. All right, then you test these to see if you can inject script. And you know, it's so we've, uh, here's a kind of cute one, might be worth looking at this one, a t five tag attribute value. Let me see if I can get to it be in Firefox. Um, this was one from the book that I thought was fun. Yeah, so here you got an image resizer. So 50% and 50%, when you submit it, it draws this cat, 50% and 50%. And if you were to make it like 10% high, then it would be, you know, you can imagine this being somebody's uh, fun little thing to play. So now it squeezes the cat. So, But if you think about what's happening here, I'm controlling something inside a URL. So if I go here and look at the um, page source, and I think I can make it bigger. Yeah. So here, I am controlling this value. That came from me. So what I control is inside an image tag. 
So I can't just put a script tag right away. I'd have to close the image tag and then put in a script tag. So that can be done. So if I want to inject something, this is what the inject would be. I put in 50% and then I close the apostrophe and then I close the tag and then I inject a script tag. So this will do it. If I put that in, then I get the pop-up. And uh, you see I have some extra code here that I broke. I did some collateral damage to the page. And if you view the source, you can see how it works. Now it has height equals 50% and that the width is not specified. Then comes my script. And here's some extra HTML just hanging out at the end, which is not used anymore because my, attack, my injection was kind of sloppy. And another thing you can do is you can put in a um, one of these handlers. So here I put in an on-click event handler. I think that might be the right term. I might have the wrong technical term for this thing. But I add this inside there. Now it's just sitting here, but when I click that, it'll pop the box. So when I look at the source code, I did not inject a script tag at all. Instead, I injected an event handler. And these things are awesome. You can put JavaScript event handlers. Yes, I could have commented the rest of it out. Yeah, that would have been a cleaner attack in the last one. So here, I didn't have to inject a script tag or a less than sign or a greater than sign. I added an event handler to a tag that was already there. So this is one of those nasty things like uh, numerical SQL injection, where if you think you can block SQL injection by blocking apostrophes, that's not really true under some conditions. There are some cases where you can inject without the apostrophe. And here's a case where I can inject JavaScript without a script tag. So that opens other possibilities. So uh, we talked about that. And here's a JavaScript string. All right. And so if you have an attribute, then you can put in like a JavaScript alert. You can use the onclick event handler. Um, you can use JavaScript colon, so you don't have to put in the script tag. And it turns out there's an awful lot of ways to sneak script in without directly having a script tag. So the co most common event filters uh, try to block a sig signature of an attack or to sanitize it by removing certain characters or truncating it to a fixed length. And all these are fairly easy to get around. So if it's a signature-based filter, you'll get a warning here saying a potentially dangerous form value was detected. So you, you hit a, a signature of an attack. So you can just try moving parts of the string until it goes away. Then you'll find what triggered it, which would be something like script. Then you can just try all the different ways to modify this tag until it's no longer recognized. That's why this and all these rely upon the process I've been saying you should not do from the beginning. You get something that has dangerous junk in it, then you try to sanitize it, and then you use it. You know, if it has anything dangerous in it, you should just block it, and you should also block my IP address after I try four or five of these in a few minutes and say, you're obviously an evil hacker, I'm not going to deal with you anymore, then I wouldn't be able to get away with this stuff. Not so easily. So if script is blocked, you can try these ways to do it. Object, this puts it inside a data structure. Here it's put inside the data structure, but it's encoded with base64. Here's another way to encode it with base64. You know, so I'm sneaking in a script tag, but it might not hit the filter because it might not be able to reverse these encodings to get there. All right. And so I, I have some demonstrations, but I think I don't need to do it. It's pretty obvious what they'll do. Um, the interesting thing about the demonstration is not so much how it works, but to see which browsers it works in. More and more browsers are smart enough to stop this stuff. And so there's lots of event handlers on ready state change, on error, uh, before activate, on activate, on focus. There are many, many ways to make a script run when something happens. And so autofocus, uh, you can automatically focus to something, and then you can have script that runs on focus. So even though you don't click anything, this will happen when the page loads. Um, this would be on when the mouse moves, and so on. You can also put in um, new tags. HTML5 has some new tags. You can even use tags that are no good. 
which is kind of funny. Um, here's ways to avoid the script tag where you put in JavaScript instead of a URL. And uh, here's you used to be able to use on begin. Now you can use this thing. Or no, it's the opposite. It used to do that. Now you can do on begin. Um, all right. Here you can put null bytes in to break the string to stop any C based filtering system, which is very common because your web application firewall is trying to be fast. So it's typically running compiled C code, and therefore the null will block it. Then you can try this, which I think is good, clean, fun. You can put in an invalid HTML code. And since the JavaScript engine runs at a different pass than the HTML engine, even though the HTML is invalid, the uh, event handler will still take effect, which is kind of nuts. And this is exploiting the strange thing about websites, which is you have multiple languages in the same file being run together by multiple passes through the file which is a pretty intrinsically dangerous thing. All right. And um, you can modify the base. So the, you can change the base up here to point to a different script. And now when they run scripts on the page, they will be inadvertently referring to your URL, not their own. And this will run a different script. That's a way to trick a page into using a script from the wrong server. You can put in, now if you have a space, IMG space on error equal alert, and it's catching you, then you can avoid the space by putting in other characters like tabs, carriage return, line feed, and quotation marks, and uh, comments in various strange languages. These things can be used, and browsers will often accept it. And this is one of the fundamental problems with HTML is it's very forgiving. HTML naturally does this sanitizing thing. Much of the web contains errors, like practically everything from Yahoo. And so your browser will let you see a page with errors. It will try to clean up the errors and guess what you meant and show you that. So you can get away with all sorts of erroneous entries in a browser. And the null bytes, of course, might work. You can often use other things than quotes around this. You can use single quotes or even backticks or even funny things that uh, aren't even supposed to be delimiters. So if the filter is unaware that backticks work, then it won't know that this is the opening and closing of something, and that will confuse it. Um, and you can use, um, you can encode characters or insert nulls in them to hide it from the script. Another one coming up where you use funny foreign characters that look kind of like opening and closing quotes, and some browsers will accept it. Um, you can use all these different formats to um, encode a character. You can put it in base 10 or hexadecimal with various formats. And uh, there's double encoding, which was a big issue in an earlier version of IIS, where you have percent %25 3C. And so the percent %25 stands for percent. So at the first decoding, uh, called canonicalization. This will turn into percent %3c, and if it's decoded a second time, it'll then turn into a less than sign. And yeah, this was the one. These funny things are Unicode, these angle break looking things, and some uh, browsers will accept that as a substitute for less than and greater than. So it's another way you can sneak in something which will ultimately be treated as a tag by the browser but is not recognized as a tag by the firewall. All right, uh, browsers tolerate extra brackets. You can put double brackets around things. Um, you can even do this weird thing with curly braces in Firefox. You know, this is um, a lot of different browsers accept different strange things. So if you want to, you can put on the web developer add-on and then it will show you what Firefox did to fix the code which might be a way to help understand what's happening here. That is madness. You know, if you write C and you make a mistake, it won't compile. It says fix your code. But if you write lousy HTML, browsers will still try to fix it for you and show you the page, which opens up the door to all these weird attacks. You can put characters in in all different sets. There's UTF-7, US ASCII, UTF-16, where you have these null bytes in between everything. 
Um, you, now you're supposed to tell the browser the character set, but if you don't, it will guess. And here's one that's kind of nuts. Uh, the system was developed using 16-bit, I think, encoding, not byte. 16-bit, I'm pretty sure. 16-bit encoding scheme for Japanese characters. And so, what you can do is the first input blocks quotes. Um, you can input in this funny language and give it only one byte. And then, when it processes the input, it will consume the next byte, interpreting that as a two-byte character. So it will break the quotation mark. So it's kind of cute. It's a way to remove a filter that the developer put there. You can put in a, if you're in the right kind of encoding scheme, then it will cause it to suck a character out of it. This is rather like injecting comments, opening comments, which would remove some code the developer put there. This will remove just one byte the developer put there. All right, and so you can sneak script code in a lot of ways, Unicode, um, extra escape characters, you know, there's just a lot of these tricks. A to B is one of the functions that converts base 64 to readable text and the opposite is B to A. So these are ways to encode, send in encoded stuff and then run a script that would decode it. You can dynamically construct strings. So this is A to B of this stuff. Here you do string from character code and give it uh, base 10 character codes. Here you evaluate a string addition which puts pieces of your JavaScript together. And all of these will prevent a simple filter from detecting that you've got the forbidden alert tag in there. There are alternatives to eval are out there. You can define functions, ways to uh, avoid the dots. There's just a lot of ways to re-encode things. All right, I don't think I'll bother with that. This gets sort of mind-numbing at this point. But you can combine the techniques where you have a string here, then you um, encode the backslash. You know, you've this is going to be alert, and you've added some extra. This is a backslash semicolon, which will do nothing, and this is the e in Unicode. So this horrible mess is the word alert. All right, and there's VBScript mentioned in here, but VBScript is now abandoned, so we're not going to bother with that. So, you know, like I mentioned before, when we were looking at DuckDuckGo and Google, this is the right way to do it. If the user types in a less than, you should turn it into ampersand LT semicolon, so it will look like less than, but it will not be processed by the browser as the beginning of a tag. Um, that's a very common and strong sanitization technique. And then you'd have to make an attack string without those using something like an event handler. So, uh, all right. And so if you don't remove all instances, then I can just put in two and it'll only remove one. If you don't do recursively, then if I put in one and the remainder is a script, I'll sneak one in. Um, all right. So this first script removes script recursively, and it doesn't find the script. Then it removes object, and that creates a script, and it doesn't know that it has to make another pass and look for script. You know, so that's another way to go. And we mentioned this one. You control something inside a parameter. So now you can uh, inject code inside there, inside non-click handler. If you have a length limit, then you can try to make your attacks very short. Um, there are online packers to make scripts shorter, but if your script is very simple, it can't be made any shorter. All right, uh, you, but you can span multiple locations. So if I have a series of parameters like page ID, seed, and mode, and I can inject into all of them, then I can combine them. So I inject this way, page ID equals, um, then I insert the script, then I start a comment, which comments out this seed equals, then I have the alert, then I start another comment, so I comment out this, so I can 
you know, comment out part of the text that the developer put there and build my attack out of the parts I control. Even though they have length limits, they will only let me put a few characters in each one. All right. And uh, you can convert reflected cross-site scripting to document object model if you insert your own JavaScript, which will then calculate something. I'm not quite sure what the point of this is, except perhaps to evade a filter, but this is how I can fetch with JavaScript part of the URL that comes after the pound sign and then um, put it on the page. So that would be, I'd have some kind of JavaScript to let me do this, and that would let me insert whatever was here, so it might be a way to overcome a length limit. I can only insert this short script, but this short script can inject something else which might be longer, that sort of thing. All right, and uh, there's other ways to do it, but that's the point here. You, you, this location hash thing fetches part of the URL and then displays it on the page, creating DOM-based XSS. All right, so let's take a look at the last cahoots, which are here. I guess that's it. All right. What attack posts a malicious page and just waits for targets to find it and visit it naturally? Yep, that's watering hole. Good. All right. What attack will insert the first part of a 16-bit character to use up a character? Was that shift JIS thing? All right. All right. What character might cause a filter to stop working so the script can get through? Yep, that's the null byte. A terminator string in a C based system. All right, what function decodes script written in base sixty four? Yeah, ASCII to binary. The base sixty four is ASCII, and the decoded stuff is binary. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> 